Good morning. This hearing is now called to order. Not that you were disorderly before. <laughs> Good morning, and I want to thank you all for coming. My name is Council Member Debbie Rose, and I am the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. Today we are conducting an oversight hearing on Neighborhood Advisory Boards, or NABs. I would first like to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his commitment to youth of New York City as well as his dedication to reducing poverty through New York, throughout New York City. I would also like to thank all the advocates, youth program providers, and all those who came to testify today for showing up to this important hearing. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us. Um, that's going to be easy. Uh, <clears throat> who will be joining us. Um, there, uh, but on, in, uh, in their behalf, there is another uh, hearing of multiple committees at the same time. The Committee on Youth Services has a special opportunity to help New York City through a specific focus on youth and community development. As the committee provides general oversight over the Department of Youth and Community Development, or DYCD, it is important to forge a collaborative path forward into progress. One of the main goals of DYCD, and thus this committee, as well as the overarching New York City Council, is to ensure that the community thrives by providing programming and funding within communities throughout New York City. Unfortunately, as great a city as New York is, there is still a large number of neighborhoods that lack resources and experiences high rates of poverty. That is why, in supplement to city funding, the New York, New York City receives and administers through DYCD federal funding known as the Community Service Block Grant, or CSBG program. Since 1996, DYCD has been New York City's designated Community Action Agency, or CAA, thus allowing DYCD to administer this federal funding. The goal of the CS, CSBG program is to reduce poverty, revitalize low-income communities, and empower low-income families and individuals in rural and urban areas to become self-sufficient, thus aligning well into DYCD's overarching goals. In order to adequately disperse CSBG funding, DYCD targets low-income communities, which are designated as Neighborhood Development Areas, or NDAs. NDAs are clusters of census tracts that meet the criteria of 30% or more poor residents within a minimum size of 4,000 poor residents. Throughout these NDAs, DYCD oversees a wide range of NDA programs which focuses on things such as high school youth, adult literacy, housing, and seniors, among others. Currently, the New York City um, New York City has 42 areas throughout all five boroughs that are designated as NDAs. In efforts to effectively address problems within NDAs, each NDA has a Neighborhood Advisory Board, or a NAB, or NAB. A NAB has the power to directly influence DYCD's recognition of specific funding needs and priorities within the NDA and DYCD's allocation of federal CSBG funding to address these needs. NABs are comprised of at least six members selected by DYCD and up to six members appointed by elected public officials. A fully appointed NAB that is representative of the community and its elected officials is essential for impoverished communities to communi communicate their needs and priorities for an appropriate funding response. However, there appears to be a large number of vacancies on NABs throughout the city. This is concerning. An ineffective NAB could result in a lack of CSBG funding and thus could lead to a community's true funding needs not being met. In an effort to provide real feedback on the service needed, and gaps in programming that exist throughout New York City's many impoverished neighborhoods, DYCD released its Community Needs Assessment Report. 
The report was based on feedback from residents and institutional leaders, as well as directors of DYCD funded programs and participants in anti-poverty programs funded by CSBG programs. This report revealed that there are significant disparities in poverty based on race, gender, immigrant status, and geography. While identifying noticeable gaps in services in areas such as education, employment, and basic needs, including housing, legal assistance, and emergency shelter. In response to the report's results, DYCD made several recommendations to lessen the challenges that NABs and NDAs experience. Today I would like to know the implementation status of the 2017 Community Needs Assessment Report's recommendations and to understand what we can do to address the large number of NAB or NAB member vacancies. I also would like to know how NDA lines are drawn, as well as how this process is being improved to account for extremely diverse neighborhoods of New York City. Lastly, I would like to learn about NDA programs, any new programs that have been added to the portfolio, and how these programs serve residents. I look forward to hearing from those invited to testify and would like to thank my staff and um, Issa Rogers and the committee staff, Paul Senegal, Kevin Katowski, Michelle Peregrine, and Elizabeth Arts. And now. We've been joined by Council Member Brandon. Oh, and um, we've been joined by Council Member Bran uh, Brandon. Thank you. Okay, panel, would you mind raising your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony this morning, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Would you please state your names for the record? Sandra Gutierrez. Sandra Gutierrez. Okay. Mike Bobbitt. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You can begin with your testimony. Okay. Good morning, Chair Rose and members of the City Council Youth Services Committee. My name is Sandra Gutierrez, Deputy Commissioner for Community Development at the Department of Youth and Community Development, or DYCD. I am joined by Mike Bobbitt, Assistant Commissioner of Community Action Programs. On behalf of DYCD's Commissioner, Bill Chang, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify on the Neighborhood Advisory Boards. The Federal Community Services Block Grant, or CSBG, program originated as part of President Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty and is a tool for states and localities to address issues of poverty. CSBG is a legacy of the 1964 Economic Opportunity Act, which was intended to mobilize the human and financial resources of the U.S. to combat poverty. In 1981, Congress established a cur the current CSBG program and authorized the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to make grants to states. States are, in turn, required to pass along the funds to eligible entities, specifically the organizations which have been certified as community action agencies under the 1964 Act. DYCD serves as one of over a thousand local action, community action agencies nationwide that receive CSBG funding. DYCD CSBG funding is administered through the New York State Department of State, and DYCD is required to distribute the funding in accordance with the goals of the federal CSBG statute, which is the reduction of poverty, the revitalization of low-income communities, and the empowerment of low-income families and individuals in rural and urban areas to become fully self-sufficient. The Opportunity Act of 1964 also called for maximum feasible participation in how the resources were used. The city accomplishes this through the establishment of 
the Community Action Board, or the CAB. This board includes representatives of low-income communities targeted low-income communities targeted the private sector and elected public official and meets every 10 weeks. The CAB advises DYCD on the overall implementation of its CSPG program and acts as a policy resource group. DYCD further demonstrates maximum feasibility participation through 42 neighborhood advisory boards or NABs, one of each one in each neighborhood identified by DYCD to receive targeted anti-poverty funding. NAB members who are selected to be representatives of the low-income communities targeted by DYCD to receive services fill 22 out of 45 seats on the Community Action Board. Local elected officials fill 15 seats and the private sector fills the remaining eight seats. About half of the city's $32.6 million uh, CSBG award is allocated to citywide initiatives, including fatherhood, literacy, and SYEP. The other half of the funding is distributed to the Neighborhood Development Area, or NDA, programs whose program priorities are identified by the local NABs. The, the Neighborhood Development Area Initiative fosters community-level engagement to ensure both that residents have opportunities to contribute to the change in their community and that the services provided address the most pressing needs of each community. Each NDA is represented by a Neighborhood Advisory Board, or NAB, with the authority to help identify community priorities and recommend specific programs. Each NAB has 12 seats. Six members may be selected by DYCD and six members may be appointed by the elected public officials. Each member may serve two consecutive three-year terms. NABs must be full-time residents of the NDA they represent, have lived in the neighborhood for a minimum of six months, be at least 16 years of age, have no formal associations with any organizations that receive DYCD funding under the CSBG program. Given DYCD's commitment to full community input in, into the involvement, input in involvement in the process, recruitment of the NAB members is ongoing. We are constantly seeking out new members to join the boards to replace veteran members who leave for various reasons such as term limits or personal obligations. Inspired by the recent decision to permit 16-year-olds to serve on community board members, DYCD updated its rules to similarly permit 16-year-olds to join NABs, and we have begun to engage our providers in spreading the word about this opportunity. We have received helpful recruitment assistance from the offices of the Bro Brooklyn Borough President and the Queens Borough President, and welcome the City Council's continued assistance in identifying local community members who wish to serve on the NAB. In FY19, DYCD used $14.8 million in CSPG funding to support approximately 200 organizations that provide services to residents of targeted low-income communities throughout the city. There are seven program areas. Opportunity Youth Supportive Work Experience provided about 700 young people ages 16 to 24 who are not in school or, or working with work readiness training, counseling, and up to 140 of the supported, of supported paid work experience in jobs that match the youth's interests and provides opportunities for, the career, for career exploration. Providers also assist youth in in developing post-program plans for education and unsubsidized employment. Education support. High school youth helped 
1,200 high school students in risk of dropping out to develop academic, personal, workplace skills necessary to obtain high school diplomas. Programs include youth leadership development and help students gain skills to support their success in college, training programs, and jobs. Adult literacy. Adult basic education and general education development test preparation provided instruction in reading, writing, mathematics to, pro to prepare 1,565 adults who are reading below ninth grade level to attain high school equivalency and transitioning into the labor force, vocational training, and higher education. Seniors, social, cultural, and supportive services assisted 3,500 homebound and non-homebound adults to maintain the highest degree of self-sufficiency and social engagement so they can remain in their homes and engaged in their community. Housing, advocacy and assistance helped 3,100 individuals and families facing foreclosure, eviction, rent issues, and substandard housing conditions to maintain safe and affordable housing. Immigrants supported services provided 1,271 immigrants and their children with the tools and resources to become self-sufficient, navigate the system, and obtain permanent residency or citizenship. This allows people to strengthen their families and improve their living conditions. Healthy families. Support services worked with 3,400 families to address issues concerning child care, domestic violence, substance abuse, HIV AIDS, physical and mental well-being. This includes advocacy and assistance in obtaining government benefits and other social services. To ensure that these services continue to meet the needs of local communities each year, the 42 NABs invite CSBG-funded organizations and community residents to meetings where they exchange information about their respective roles in the community. They give an overview of the scope of their services and testify about the community challenges they experience. They also discuss strategies on how best they can work together. This forum also allows local community residents and also community stakeholders to understand the allocation decisions. Additionally, the NABs played a critical role in our 216 Community Needs Assessment, or CNA, which we use to obtain stakeholder input on program design and quality. Through surveys and public hearings, DYCD collected feedback directly from New York City residents and institutional leaders on service needs and gaps in their communities. The 216 assessment involved DYCD's beacons and cornerstone community centers, allowing us to reach even more community members than in previous years. We also collected feedback from program directors in DYCD-funded programs throughout the city and participants in anti-poverty programs funded through CSPG. The methods for collection included both street canvassing and public hearings for each NDA conducted by its own NAB members. As a result of this large-scale effort, over 1,300 surveys were collected from 9,640 adults, 2,439 youth, 238 employers, 38 faith-based leaders, 372 CSBG program directors, 539 CSBG program participants, and 155 public school principals. We are pleased to report that for the second straight year, DYCD has received a perfect score, 50 out of 50, for meeting the federal organizational standards, ensuring that the community action agencies, such as DYCD, can demonstrate having results-oriented management and accountability 
principles in place to reduce poverty or alleviate the conditions of poverty in their respective jurisdictions. Categories range from consumer input and organizational structure to, to fiscal health. The score reflects DYCD's practices, including the operations of the Community Action Board and the Neighborhood Advisory Boards, as well as our 216 Community Needs Assessment and our upcoming 219 Community Needs Assessment plans. The data collected through CNA has been used throughout DYCD and informed the operation of programs throughout our portfolio. For example, the CNA showed a high number of youth reported being hungry and, and we used that result to establish greater connection between our programs and those that provide basic needs such as food pantries. The results of the next CNA will be helpful in setting funding priorities for CSPG funded programs in the future, particularly for the future plans in the next concept paper and request for proposals. We look forward to continuing to brief the council on those plans uh, as we begin to move forward. DYCD is to DYCD's vision is to improve the quality of life for New Yorkers by collaborating with local organizations and investing in the talents and assets of our community to help them develop, grow, and thrive. We thank you for the opportunity to share DYCD's efforts to serve New York's low-income individuals, families, and communities. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. And um, uh, I have a few questions. No, I'm only kidding. I have a few Thank questions. Uh, okay. how, effect how effective are the NABs in identifying funding priorities and recommending specific programs for CSBG funding? And what type of performance indicators are tracked and monitored in order to understand if programs are effective or not? So to your first question, um, the funding priorities are identified by the questions in the survey, or rather the results of the survey, the, the community needs assessment. And so they uh, get to choose uh, various answers on the survey that tells us which are most in need uh, for their particular community. And out of that information, then we identify based on the funding or based on the answers, what should be funded in that particular neighborhood. I'll let you speak to the second question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Mike Bobbitt, Assistant Commissioner. You asked about metrics. So DYCD yes. determines some uh, method of validated proof for each of the programs that are funded under CSBG. So there's a program design. And when the request for proposals is issued, the providers, when they submit their proposals, know there's going to be some objective measure or proof of the outcome that is anticipated to be obtained. And then over the life of the contract, DYCD, program managers, they go out in the field and they observe programmatically and administratively how the programs are doing. So that's how we're, the city is able to achieve assurances that what's anticipated to happen is happening. And if agencies underperform, we go out and we provide technical assistance and coaching to try to help them meet the um, expectations. So, um, what what are some of the metrics that you look for to determine whether a program is effective um, or pos or or not? Sure. So. Um, one of the programs the Deputy Commissioner listed was Healthy Families. Mm -hmm. So the expectation of that program is that there are residents in each community who may have some social services need or there's something that they're looking for that will help stabilize either the individual or the family. And that could be pretty broad ranging. Mm -hmm. So we've given a, um, a matrix, if you will. There's a lot of different buckets. Um, mm -hmm. And the Deputy Commissioner referenced some of those things. People might be coming in to get health needs met or child care, or elder care, the kind of needs met. So in any case, we would expect the provider to collect some sort of documentation that once the participant has come in and express what it is that they're looking for, maybe they've prioritized, okay, you need one or more things, what do you need first? <laughs> What's a win that we can help get your family? Once they've collected evidence that they've gotten that, they would keep that in their files 
and we also make it easy for providers. They can upload that information so one of our program managers from the office can look and see that there's validated proof. So that's the sort of thing that we look for. So that is reported to you via um, some sort of reporting mechanism? Yes. Um, so as I said, two things. One, the providers would keep information on f in their records on site. Our staff review those records, the sample, uh, a, they'll do a sample of caseload, can sample of files while they're out in the field. But we try to make it uh, easier for the providers and very straightforward for ourselves. So I hadn't mentioned this, but there's also case notes and DYC has a database that allows the providers, uh, the staff that's funded on the contract, to report on the progress of the case. So we're able to follow through the case notes what's happening with the with the participants. And you revert, you review that at what level of frequency, or is it the um, randomly? The, ex the expectation is that programs are visited two to three times a year. If there are performance concerns, we will reprioritize those particular programs, give them a little <coughs> extra love and, and attention. Mm -hmm. And um, as the Deputy Commissioner mentioned earlier in her testimony, our funding is overseen from the New York State Department of State. Mm -hmm. So we review how the programs are doing on a quarterly basis, and then we share our analysis with the state, so then they're also able to get assurances of the monitoring that we do. Um, what are some of the major challenges that the NABs face in trying to alleviate poverty and revitalize low-income neighborhoods? Some of the challenges are that um, we, first of all, I think that the CSBG program does a great job of, of doing exactly that. I think we take great care um, to use the funds in the way that they are intended. Um, I think the, the, the good news about this is that the communities are identifying their own priorities, right? We also have uh, uh, many programs that uh, DYCD funds. So we also uh, invest in those same communities where those CSBG funds are. We have lots of other programs that we can leverage that can be you know, the, where we form collaborations and partnerships so that we are focusing on the poorest of those neighborhoods. So in that way, I think that uh, DYCD does a great job of not only using the CSBG funds, but the CSBG community needs assessment helps us to identify where the poorest, most vulnerable uh, citizens in New York City are. So um, you do do a, a good job with um, the CSBG um, funds, uh, but are there some challenges that you know present themselves that the NABs have in, in trying to meet, you know, the demands of alleviating poverty is like a huge, a huge undertaking. So are there some challenges that present themselves that um, the, the Neighborhood Advisory Action Boards, you know, encounter? I think that their job, uh, the neighborhood advisory boards, their roles are very specific to identifying the priorities to conducting those um, surveys, right? So if they were asked perhaps about there being a challenge, it might be that they never feel satisfied in how many uh, surveys they can collect because they want to do a whole lot more. But there's 10, uh, uh, board members. So um, I think that they might say that they would like to collect more or, or do more. Um, I think uh, they might say that um, that you know they'd like to know what other city agencies are doing um, in terms of poverty, perhaps maybe uh, more collaborations in that regard. But I think those are uh, four people on the ground who aren't NAB members, I think that's what they'd say, that they'd like to be able to get, uh, identify even more priorities through more people. And uh, one thing that might they might say also is that these communities are changing rapidly. So how do you, how do you get um, those, to those priorities um, every three years um, may change. Do you think that they have enough resources to, to get the job done? 
We, uh, the, the CSBG funds have been, uh, I'll let you speak to that question, but. Thank you. Um, we, we do. <laughs> the, um, the CSBG, I think with the Deputy Commissioner's points, the CSBG funding has remained stable, even though, uh, you know, by any metric you might want to use, uh, it, it's a lot more expensive <laughs> to deliver social services, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say DYC is, is thankful for the increase in its overall budget, and an important part of the service strategy is leveraging the CSBG funding with other funding both that DYC has received and also pointing participants and families in need to other social services that the city is delivering. So I think that's that's an important part of it. Uh, but I think the other thing to point to is we're appreciative that we have NAB members uh, as stakeholders in the community. So even though they're, not even though, so they serve as volunteers at no cost to the agency, but by being aware of their own charge do the needs assessment, identifying the priorities, and also becoming more conversant of what DYCD is funding. They're also able, able in the community to direct folks to, to the services that DYC and the city are providing. The CAB is a citywide body composed of 22 low-income residents, 15 elected officials, and eight private sector appointees that participate in the development of the CSBG funding opportunities. However, DYCD ultimately awards these funds. How much deference is paid to the CAB's recommendations in DYCD's funding decisions? Are there any particular programs or funding areas for which DYCD has disagreed with the CAB recommendations? And if so, can you describe them? Well, the CAB uh, members participate in the survey in conducting the implementation of the survey. So they're partners, the CAB and the NAB are partners in uh, conducting the uh, community needs assessment. Um, we've not experienced um, recommendations that are different from what the community has said because they understand that these uh, recommendations are coming from the community. They wouldn't trump uh, the recommendations of the community that come through the community needs assessment. That's probably so something they wouldn't there's, do. there's complete consensus with whatever the CAB, um, the, their recommendations. DYCD um, hasn't had instances where you disagreed or, or felt that the funds should be spent, you know, in a different area than what their, the CABs. Uh, recommended the NAB's recommendations. Um, the the, the talking, community yeah. needs assessment recommendations. Well, I'm talking about how much now. I'm talking about the CAB now. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. um, and you know how much deference is given to their decisions. Are they the overarching? Once they make a decision, that's the, the decision that is followed. Uh, we can answer. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to um, clarify that. DYCD is one of maybe 200 of the community action agencies of the thousand that are public community action agencies. So in those instances, uh, as a government entity, we have the fiduciary responsibility. Right. So there is a relationship, I would say a very collegial, very um, collaborative relationship with the community action board. But to buttress and support what the deputy commissioner is, is, is saying, since the findings are coming from the community, from the community needs assessment. Mm -hmm. When we're reporting to the board, and I've, I've only been with the agency nine years, but I'm not aware of an instance where there's been mm -hmm. disagreement between the community action board and DYC about what, um, what the data is pointing to, mm -hmm. and then the administrative responsibilities to try to provide supportive services. What I can say is one of the ways that we demonstrate the maximum feasible participation that the deputy commissioner referenced and the oversight that I was mentioning with the, the stay is we do an annual review with the board related yeah. to program performance. And if there were corrective measures taken or, or other, um, what's, I'm trying to think of a good, good example. If programs are under or overperformed, and I'm happy to report sometimes there's overperformance too, <laughs> we share great. that with the board in terms of what does this mean for directions forward. Uh, and generally, the, the, the CAB has been supportive of those decisions. If there's any questions, we can always follow yeah. up about over the course of the contracts, how things are going. Um, with your experience, um, is there, are there any areas in which you think the CAB could improve its efficacy? 
I'd point to one recent example where I think it demonstrates that they have. So there's a few committees under the Community Action Board. One was historically known as membership, and they recently changed their name to, 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 sorry, to strategic partnerships. It better reflected what the ambition of the committee was, and that was to increase the connectivity between the CAB and the NABs and the community at large. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that as an illustration of recognition of roles and really working cooperative with DYCD. I also think that in the last uh, couple of years, and particularly in the last one, the CAB has the we've changed the way that we do meetings to be more engaging. The the meeting you came to, and thank you for coming, right. uh, was, you know, we we placed the seats the way that they were because we expected, um, we expected some elected officials to show up that day. But generally, it's very interactive. We have people um, answering questions, um, um, giving us advice. We have all kinds of uh, facilitative um, uh, workshops or conversations happening where it elevates the conversation about the, not just the role of the, of the CAB, but what is going on in the city. So I think in the last a uh, couple of years, we've really changed the dynamics of that group so that they feel, and you saw that they have no qualms in asking questions. They ask mm -hmm. incredible good questions, um, and they're very, very engaged. They, they love coming to that meeting. Okay. Which it, it, sometimes you can't not you cannot say that about every me, every community <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I'm not going to comment. I'm not, I'm not comment. Um, um, in regard to the the neighborhood advisory board um, members, which elected officials, um, city council or state officials, recommend members for the NABs? I'm sorry, you mean in terms of type of stakeholders? Yeah, we, so we yeah. look we look um, for um, referrals by the city council members as well as state assembly and senate mm -hmm. and U.S. Uh, House of Representatives. So. Are they all city council members or are they city council members just where the, um, the neighborhood advisory boards are? Um, the elected action. officials that correspond to the catchment area, so the boundaries of that particular okay. neighborhood development area. Okay. And how does DYCD select the candidate, your candidates that serve on the NABs? The selection of those candidates basically is, uh, it comes through other NAB members or community members that have learned of the NABs either through our website or at our, uh, uh, when there are public events. Um, they can uh, do that independently or uh, come through an NAB member. And um, when and how do you communicate with elected officials that they need to make appointments uh, to the NAB? Well, I know that we send letters when um, somebody is getting off the board because they've termed out. So uh, that's one way we communicate. And we also have an external affairs unit that helps, um, that supports uh, the CSBG. I, I think uh, there's a number of vacancies, right? Um, there are. That are on the board. Can you tell me how many uh, vacancies exist for the NAB? And um, and what the uh, what might be a contributing factor to those well, vacancies? Um, on the uh, DYCD uh, appointed, we have 92% of the seats filled. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on, the, on the elected officials, there is 58% uh, filled. Um, what's, uh, can you tell me why there's, why sort of your understanding these vacancies exist? Sure. So on the NABs, um, 98, 92% is uh, pretty, pretty standard only because, um, you know, people are moving off the board and coming onto the board. So that's sort of the, the rolling participation that happens. Um, and so you, you have a little bit of cushion for people to get off, get on. And then there are some people that move away from those areas or they have um, um, personal 
-hmm. issues that they have to get off and can't participate fully. And the vacancy rate for elected officials? It's a little more difficult um, because um, we have other, uh, we, we, we try to get in touch with the elected officials to let them know that these, uh, these are vacancies, but it's really up to them and that's really not uh, in our control for. How uh, frequent are these, you know, um, communications, communicates with elected officials to let them know that a, a vacancy exists and, you know, is there a follow up? If uh, yes, no we make calls. Action. We we um, we also recommend people that they could put on the boards. You you make recommendations to. We can make recommendations. Uh -huh. Yes, um, and you you let them know in writing that this vacancy exists. Yes. So, um, is there anything that? might be done that could facilitate this process a little more um, efficient, efficiently? Yes. So that, um, because 58% of the elected's um, appointments is, um, is rather low. It is, but I think um, the good news is that in the last month, um, in the last couple of months, since January, I believe, it, we went from 72% to 58%. What that means is that we have been focusing, first of all, we've been focusing much more uh, at DYCD with identifying the right people that could get us uh, the seats uh, filled. The other is that we have more staff. We've added four more staff, mm -hmm. and because of that, uh, they are, you know, very focused on getting the seats filled. Do you, um, so when do you anticipate um, being able to bring this number up? Do you have a timeline? We've not done, we've not had that discussion, um, um, or I've not had that discussion with my staff, but I'm happy to go back and have it and, and give you an answer on that. Um, you meet quarterly, the, what, what how frequently does the, do the NABs meet and the CABs meet? So the CABs meet every 10 weeks. Let's see. Okay. And the NABs are required to meet four times a year, but we meet many more times a year. And in on the year when we're conducting the community needs assessment, they probably meet about three or four times, depending on what the activities are. So they, meet, they also meet for training besides their meetings. They also meet for training, for new orientation training, uh, for uh, training on the, to conduct the needs assessment, to gain instruction and guidance on what should they be doing at their uh, local uh, communities. Is your year considered a calendar year or the fiscal year? Calendar, right? It's uh, the program year. So um, th there's two ways to answer that. <laughs> that uh -huh. w w one is, uh, as the Deputy Commissioner uh, mentioned, they meet on a quarterly basis. So as neighborhood volunteers, uh, they meet frequently, irrespective of when we have the report. <laughs> but in terms of corresponding to the CAB calendar, the federal fiscal year starts in October and ends in September. So the first time of the year the CAB meets corresponds to the start of the federal fiscal year, yes, and then they meet through okay. through June. I wanted to circle back to one thing. The Deputy Commissioner is being very modest, but as one of the people that report to her, I do want to uh, advise there's a, there's a vacancy chart <laughs> that we review with the Deputy Commissioner, and we do have targeted conversations about how um, vacancies are being filled over over time. So your recommendation mm -hmm. is well received, but I do want to give credit where credit is due. Okay, I was just trying to determine what your year was so that um, uh, we would know that you might bring this number up by the end of your your calendar year or your fiscal year or um, your operating year. Um, because I think it's important that, you know, the appointees from the elected officials um, should be there and if there's anything that you know we can do to help um, you know please let me know because 
this number is is troubling in terms of making sure that the there's representation. We really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate that. And I think that we, uh, both as a staff and the NABs, um, uh, really want to make sure that the that the NABs are full, and particularly because we have the community needs assessment coming up. So we want everybody represented, and we've done, I mean, there's a whole bunch of strategies that we have uh, employed in the last, um, I'd say, year and a half, just getting ready for the community needs assessment and, and, and really looking at what representation we need from those communities. So we really appreciate your help on that front. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that if mm -hmm. there's anything, um, what your recommendations might be to improve the process so that no vacancies continue to exist. Okay. Um, do NAB members decide what provider gets CSBG funding or do they identify the funding priorities and then relay this information to DYCD to choose from the group of already pre um, approved providers? Uh, the, the response is closer to the, the latter. The NAB members participate in receiving the findings through the surveys, the hearings, et cetera. That identifies the funding priorities. Then DUIC will release a request for proposals. So there aren't a, there aren't a predetermined number of providers that are going to get the awards. But as you know, the, um, the city promotes the use of HHS accelerators, so community service programs that have um, pre-qualified will see these requests for proposals once they're released, like they would see other funding proposals, and they will submit proposals. Another way the agency demonstrates maximum feasible participation is NAB members join DYC staff in reviewing the proposals. So they will... Um, uh, be aware of who uh, has submitted an application. There's a recusal for of a reason. Oh, I actually know that person is a family member. They wouldn't read those proposals, but as long as it's appropriate, they join the staff in reviewing and rating the proposals, so that the most competitive proposals are the ones awarded. Those best suited to perform the services ultimately are the ones selected. But the um, the ranking of the proposals and the determination is all DYCDs. Again, uh, we invite NAB members to join and to join the DYC staff in the rating and reviewing of the proposals themselves. So it's another way, as um, stakeholders in the community, they get to help inform that the right decisions are being made. Okay. Um, but outside of that process, um, an NAB member would not have um, direct input into who a service provider would or should be? No, they wouldn't outside of that process. Okay. Um, and in terms of training for the um, NAB members, um, how frequently is that? Um, and are they um, identified, are there duties to identify community fund? And how well, let me start again. Training for NAB members. Um, how frequent, uh, what, is, what does it look like, and um, are there, is it ongoing? We have different trainings for uh, the NAB that uh, fulfill a particular purpose. For example, the, we have uh, new orientation training for everybody who's a new member. We have to do that twice a year. Some people come, have been to uh, that orientation training, but they still keep coming because it's uh, lots of fun. Um, then we have, um, we'll be having soon our training that has to do with the community needs assessment, how to conduct it, why, what are the reasons for it. Um, we also have trainings during the year that we invite the NAB to, and they could be leadership development or all kinds of uh, uh, community involvement mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Um, we're also having um, borough meetings where we meet with um, everybody from particular boroughs, or, or if the borough is big, there's two meetings in that borough and um, we there too we talk about uh, the community efforts and uh, the community needs assessment. 
So do DYCD officials attend any of these NAB um, meetings? Yes. Yes. Is uh, and and how frequent does that happen? Do they is there always a DYCD member at NAB me um, meetings? Yes, there are. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, if there was a problem in terms of, you know, a particular NAB um, where it might indicate that more training uh, was necessary, when and how would that happen? Well, the NABs, um, we have a, 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 a liaison that works at DYCD who, who actually runs these those meetings or co-facilitates that meeting with the chairs. Usually they're very involved in whether there's a problem with a particular NAB, whether they don't have enough uh, members, whether there's, we don't have uh, issues of uh, conflict issues in, in those groups most of the time, um, but a lot of it, a, a lot of times it's just getting more members on. But they always have support and they can always call DYCD. Um, uh, they know us because we, when we invite them to meetings, so they'll know Mike, they'll know me, they'll know other staff at DYCD. If they felt like they couldn't talk to that particular liaison, they certainly, um, I know they feel free in coming because they ask questions and they call me, so I know that. Is there an assessment made of the efficacy of, of N NABs? Or we, how well uh, they're functioning, how? Yes, yeah, so this year we started to survey uh, the NABs on the quality of their meetings. Um, we wanted to know if um, they were getting to, did they have enough support? Um, we wanted to know if they were getting to the issues that, that they, thought were important. So we've been um, um, doing sort of uh, after, be, after the meetings, we, we assess and evaluate whether that meeting was a good one. Okay. How much CSBG funding um, has New York received uh, last year? And do you anticipate um, receiving the same amount this year? The, um, the deputy commissioner referenced in her testimony 32 million. There, as I'm sure you're aware, we monitor um, certain proclamations and suggestions <laughs> that are being made from the um, federal administration. Um, thankfully, there's been bipartisan support in the Congress to maintaining, sustaining CSBG funding. So uh, we continue to monitor the situation as well as look for uh, any intelligence and, and support from the city's um, legislative affairs office. But at the present, we're not anticipating discontinuation or uh, a cut to CSBG funding. We would expect level funding. Is there a figure you can give me? Uh, again, 32 million. Well, 32. At the present time, that's what we would anticipate. The refunding application usually made available sometime in the mm -hmm. mid summer, so we would know concretely uh, by the end of the summer. So that's the that's the half. That's the only for CSBG. Uh, I understood that's your question to be right. About, okay. Yes, that's okay. for CSBG. Okay. Um, and does DYCD know in advance um, how much the federal funding will be? that will be provided to the CSBG? Um, again, no, we would be looking over the course of the summer to learn that that's about when the mm -hmm. Department of State communicates the decision to DYCD. Mm -hmm. um, do you have, do, do you make a, a funding recommendation to, <laughs> to the feds of what you would like or you, that you think would be um, adequate to to address poverty, uh, I would I would say DYC specifically uh, may not make that recommendation, but there are other parties who uh, are allies to the city in that regard. Uh, there's the National Community Action Partnership, which is a technical assistance body that supports all of the community action agencies across the country, and there's the National Community Action Foundation, which is a lobbying group that supports the award. So, uh, in particular. The NCAF is very vocal okay. <laughs> about the need to uh, support. It has some institutional memory. My understanding is the head of that organization has been around since the Reagan administration and continues to uh, fight for 
uh, for uh, continued CSBG funding. Uh, I had mentioned uh, the the mayor's uh, office in DC. Mm -hmm. So DYC does articulate the request to the mayor's office in they DC. Do. We do seek to see sustained funding without disruption in service. Okay. Is available federal CSBG funding ever left untapped or unallocated um, in New York City? Uh, no, it is, it is not. We always find useful purposes for CSBG. Uh, the Deputy Commissioner pointed to our support of the Summer Youth Employment Program. So if there are, which there aren't typically or not in a great degree, but if there are under-obligated funds, we're able to redirect those. So we, we leave no money on the table. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know you don't um, have a crystal ball, but are we anticipating any cut in in funding, in CSBG funding? I think in the stock market they say past performance is no indication of future. Uh, I will say we've continued to monitor the situation as I gave in my prior response. The last time the administration suggested eliminating CSBG, it was not eliminated. So we're continuing to monitor the situation. It was kept whole. Uh, we hope and presently anticipate that there won't be uh, a cut or elimination of the funding stream. If there are cuts, how will um, these cuts be addressed um, in terms of trying to fill the gaps? I, um, I think the, the most honest uh, answer to that to be is that we would have to take that, the, the question under advisement, we'd have to prepare a suitable uh, plan, but again, the current uh, thinking is we're not anticipating a cut to CSBG at this time. In terms of the four focus areas um, that DYCD realigned their goals for in 2014, what's the most challenging area to address? Could you just, I'm sorry, clarify the question further? Um, yeah, yeah you, you identified four focus areas um, when you realigned your goals. Um, at risk youth, um, uh, poverty. Learning. At risk youth, specifically high, high school youth who are struggling academically or at risk of dropping out, workforce development, providing adult literacy services and workforce training, support services for seniors, immigrants, and programs designed to keep families healthy and for disconnected youth. Thank you. And they it's a, no, it's a, it's a very reasonable question, Council Member. Um, it's hard to give a, sh a short answer, though. I think any of the programs has anecdotal successes and in some ways faces challenges, so I, I don't mean to be um, uh, coy or evasive. Uh, I'll, I'll try and give a couple of, of, of examples then. So under our youth portfolio, we recently uh, launched a program that was new to the NDA. So uh, the agency certainly has a rich history of engaging youth force. This was the first time we had a neighborhood-focused program that was looking at supportive employment. So there were some operational challenges in the first year or two of operating a program because it was a new type of program. So it's not that there isn't a demand. It's not that we haven't had a demonstrated history in serving that kind of a demand. It was just new. Um, there could be other uh, challenges. I'll try to point to one under working with seniors, it's not really a challenge, it's like an underexplored opportunity. We liaise uh, very well with the Department for the Aging mm -hmm. because they have the Title V Seniors Employment Program. We've tried to attach our programs as work sites. So we could certainly look to continue to do more of that. It's not really a problem, it's more like an opportunity we're looking to try to maximize. Let's say each program offers its own um, issues of concern and, and things that you monitor and try to coach the, the field up towards doing. So um, is there any type of plan to address the challenges that, that you face? Sure. Um, we had mentioned earlier in the testimony that at least on an annual basis we share our uh, observations of the year in, in whole with the Community Action Board, but it is the responsibility of our program managers, deputy directors, and directors to analyze performance as it's happening. Mm -hmm. So that happens across each program portfolio, but it also happens within each program within each portfolio. So if there are performance concerns, whether they be about 
uh, enrollment or retention or obtaining outcomes or seeming not to maximize some of the linkages and referrals that were e expected. We, we call on agencies, we communicate with them, we try to do that cooperatively and helpfully with them. So we recognize if they submitted the best proposal, they have understanding of local knowledge, how to serve those participants. So we serve in a kind of coaching facilitative role to help them out. So are they, um, are the providers um, evaluated and um, and given technical assistance if in fact they are um, experiencing challenges meeting the goals? Uh, yes, they are. They, um, there were written uh, summaries of program site visits which are shared with the providers and the findings are reviewed, both an attaboy, attagirl when things have gone well, mm -hmm. and to flag if there are particular uh, concerns noted and we follow up and look for a written follow up from providers if there's corrective action that needs to be taken. And like other human service contracts, the, uh, the year end results would be reflected in an agency's vendex. So if, um, if there was a, a problem with a particular contracted agency, would you pull a contract mid-term, mid mid-contract? Mid we try to perform that uh, coaching and supportive relationship with the provider in real time as things are are occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, if there were long-standing performance issues that couldn't be turned around, we would have some tough conversations with the provider. Uh, in some cases, providers have finally been able to turn it around, which is a great success. Mm -hmm. In other cases, providers have asked to give back a contract or they realize over time they haven't been able to, to pull, it, pull it off. Have you experienced um, any special challenges working with disconnected youth? So I think that um, uh, under the leadership of Commissioner Chung, he has um, really uh, taken this seriously, this population seriously. And so we've strengthened many programs that have to do with workforce um, that really uh, give um, um, support to young people who are struggling. And what he's done is he's asked us to develop pathways so that young people can move through the continuum of care in ways that maybe um, they haven't had the opportunity before if they go to individual programs. Once they leave that program, that's it. And if they fail, nobody's watching. But I think under his leadership, um, we've had many discussions and plans and strategies that uh, these pathways for young people who are opportunity youth or youth at, at risk can connect to DYCD programs, but not only one DYCD program, but they have multiple touches, one, um, multiple touches in that community, and that they connect with people that they know, with those uh, service providers that have seen them grow up. Um, we also have the ability under his leadership to to make sure that we're integrating the conversations about opportunity youth starting and like middle schools because we have we fund middle schools so there's a lot of ways that we're looking at the work not just uh, from the perspective of a funder to a CBO but um, more holistically and how all the these communities and community-based organizations really make up um, the village right mm -hmm. that then takes care of those young people when um, when a, an NAV um, identifies they when they do the assessment and they identify what the areas are of, of, of need and um, are they do they prioritize those areas they'll have maybe six areas of need yes are they are they ranked in priority or yes because order? the survey instrument is designed so mm -hmm. that it's already ranked okay so if in a particular community let's say in Bronx 10 um, they pick uh, senior services as mm -hmm. the top ranking then that would be the priority so um, if a Q, if, if a NAB um, indicated a priority 
that um, have you found that there might be a disconnect in terms of the that particular community being able to provide that those services? I'm from Staten Island, mm -hmm. um, and so if they ranked disconnected youth, mm -hmm. um, the need for housing, um, and there's no service provider um, that provides that service, what, what's the process then? Do you then go to the next ranked uh, need or well, if some, if, what if the, what if the, you know, the community isn't able to provide the resources to address the need? Yeah, and that could I, be part of the problem. Yeah, no, um, I, I can't recall that circumstance having developed. So, as the deputy mm -hmm. commissioner is pointing out, the needs assess, the well, needs assessment process itself determines the the needs mm -hmm. and the prioritization of the needs. Right. So to use your example, if in a particular uh, NDA, the highest presenting need was high school, and the second was housing, and the third was seniors, then the NAB in its uh, role of having discretion as community stakeholders could have a conversation about the allocation that's available, the money that's uh, available to serve the community, and whether that money um, goes so far to adequately support programs to address all three of those needs, or if in their um, election they wanted to invest more money in the top two of those needs, but there isn't uh, a conversation or instruction about skipping the most important need and jumping down to the, to the third. So once the priorities are set and determined by the NAB, when DYC then releases the request for proposals, we will seek um, community-based organizations to deliver the services related to the highest presenting needs as determined by each NAB. And we have been able to find um, providers to do those services. I had mentioned earlier in my testimony that when we did Opportunity Youth, it was a new program area. So because it was new, we had a little bit of, of an effort initially when we were procuring those services, but we did find, and we have providers who are serving those, those needs as well. Thank the, you. The community, I think uh, in the, these uh, NDAs are very attentive to, to the needs, and oftentimes um, community-based organizations do want to apply for funds, but maybe they they haven't had the opportunity so when the need meets um the the person who wants to provide that usually um that makes good sense for a community-based organization um moving to the ndas um how are ndas zoned or mapped do i see relies on the new york city department of city planning mm -hmm. and their use of um, current data that aggregates information about poverty. It's actually in your own opening um, statement. You, you shared some of this information. So because we try to target the NDA programs to areas where there's concentrations of, of poverty, we can rely on city planning and their use of what uh, they term neighborhood tabulation areas. So stacks of, let's say, two to three NTAs, mm -hmm. neighborhood tabulation areas, are used uh, to form the neighborhood development areas, which we try to align around community districts, but we're, again, we're using their, their, um, their data. And so that's how we know the, um, the community warrants focus in terms, of the, um, in terms of the NDA and its priorities. What steps, um, if any, does DYCD take um, in communities that, um, you know, to address gentrification that um, may exist or, or occur in pre-zoned NDAs? I, I hazard one response, and the Deputy Commissioner may have more to say about it, but it, earlier we noted that along with the NDAs themselves, we do support uh, various citywide initiatives through DYCD. So um, reflecting on your question, I was thinking that th there are certain trends that happen over time related to, to poverty. So by investing in both kinds of approaches, we're able to make sure that, um, that, that citywide there are programs that participants and families can, can access. So I'm, I think that that's the response to your question. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. 
Well, not quite. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> when um, NDAs, you already have pre, you know, pre-zone NDAs, um, and some of them become less impoverished, right, as a result of the gentrification. Um, you know, and it forces, you know, the lower income, sometimes lower income families out of those neighborhoods. That's, that's exactly end? why you need a community needs assessment to happen every three years. Because every three years, that assessment is done, we find the pockets of poverty, and those are the neighborhoods that would be funded. Um, the gentrification certainly has an impact on how um, poor people move around the city. Um, and so that's the reason why we take our job so seriously with the community needs assessment setting priorities. Wherever the, those, uh, that population goes, then we can uh, fund. And were it not for the community needs assessment, we couldn't do that. Okay. And that happens every three years. The assessment is done every three years, right? Yes, every three years. And um, the, um, the NDAs are allowed to, to serve uh, people outside the area for a half a mile also. So sometimes okay. they'll move um, just from one so neighborhood to one another, so they perimeter. still can, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when do you, um, when, uh, so is it every three years that maybe the lines would be redrawn for an NDA? Or when, when do you redraw the lines or the districts? Um, in for the whenever we are going to do prioritization of, of uh, programs and, uh, or of needs, for example, right now we have been, um, our community needs assessment will determine prioritization, so there will be uh, a look at the lines. When, okay. when the community so, needs assessment, um, I have a community that's been gentrified, mm -hmm. and so that's not that's no longer the nucleus of you know my poverty area. It's it's now moved. When will that be redrawn? Uh, when will we look at changing where and following where the poverty has shifted? Am I we're, making we're, sense? Yes, yes. We're in that process now so the community needs assessment will start in July and end sometime in November um, we will begin to study um, those uh, you know those tabulation areas and collect data about where uh, people are moving and then based on those two things the results of the community needs assessment and the data collected on the tabulation areas we will then uh, look at what are the lines how much have they moved in order to set the priorities okay Did you want to? I know. Okay. <laughs> so you're okay. Um, so it's, um, you know, I guess I was trying to get at whether, um, like the census, every 10 years, you know, we look at, at certain areas and we redistrict. Mm -hmm. So um, I was just trying to get to whether there was a specific time that you look at the the NDAs. So, okay. Um, what is that, is, it's not every th 10 years. Of, we, 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 want, we, we do the community needs assessment every three years, and they, it can be like five years before we actually fund new programs, but um, because, you know, those contracts can continue for another couple of years. Okay. Um, what official entities outside of New York City does DYCD report to regularly regarding its administration of CSBG grants? Um, we know that the Department of State is one. Mm -hmm. um, and what information is required to be reported, how frequently, and are these reports made public and posted online? Um. 
Yes, council member, we do uh, report to and share information with the New York State Department of State. Mm -hmm. There is a um, quarterly report which is filed, and I'm looking to external affairs. I believe we make this available to the city council. It's not posted publicly, but it's shared with the, the council. Mm -hmm. And um, there's an annual program report that is also filed, and that information includes the participants served and a democratic, demographic, excuse me, profile of those served as well as the projected and actual outcomes that were obtained. That information, um, for your information, the state aggregates both DYC's information and all the other grantees through the state, and uh, their data in turn is reported to the federal department, uh, excuse me, the federal uh, government through Health and Human Services. The Department of Health and Human Services has the authority to audit any particular community action agency. Mm -hmm. They have um, come to DYC on occasion. Most recently was um, end of the summer last year, the Government Accountability Office. Mm -hmm. New York was a sample of states uh, that Congress wanted to see sampled, so DYC was a sample of the New York sample. It was largely a programmatic review, um, and they reported that they were very satisfied with what they what they saw when they came on site. Okay. Do you require uh, sort of some type of similar reporting from the NABs, and if so, how frequently and you know are their reports made public? Uh, the NABs function uh, in a very complementary way to DYC, but distinctly different from the way um, human services are procured. Mm -hmm. So volunteers uh, must sign in for their uh, attendance, and I think we had uh, mentioned we reimburse them for the cost of their travel, you know, to attend meetings. But there isn't a um, there's not the same kind of programmatic responsibility placed on volunteers, and there is a contract agency, so there isn't the same kind of a quarterly reporting that we expect, but as the Deputy Commissioner mentioned, the liaisons attend the NAB meetings, and so we do track attendance and time that volunteers spend engaged with our programs, and that's actually a part of the quarterly reporting that we do to Department of State. Mm -hmm. They also keep minutes of their meetings. Um, and how, um, how have you been able to sort of address the participant concerns that do not have an NDA program or activities in their neighborhood? <laughs> or do you? I want to make sure I understand the question. You're talking about so, participants in New so York we're, City. So we're looking at the Community Needs Assessment Report. And so um, I want to know how have you been able to address the participant concerns that did not um, that did not have NDA programs or activities in their neighborhoods. So um, you know that the DYCD budget has uh, basically doubled, and so we have many, many more programs. The the information that we've gotten from the community needs assessment really has informed us about not just about uh, what's happening in the uh, CSBG programs, but also all over because all over the agency uh, and and the services that are provided through the agency because we. Um, have taken information from participants that are not in CSBG, um, the principals, as you read, the, the program directors. So we've gotten, we got a lot of information that were not just uh, from the NDAs and from uh, acquired through the NAB. Um, those, and I'll give you an example of how this has informed us, so how we've used the community needs assessment. In the community needs assessment, and I read in my testimony that um, we found that a lot of young people were hungry. And so we started to drill down on that question, right? What, mm -hmm. what, what was happening? What we found was that young people, um, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, young people who were eating not, on, not only not eating, but if they were eating, they were not eating nutritional uh, food. So the first thing that the commissioner did was to 
meet with uh, the people at HRA where we started to do so, to develop some strategies and ultimately ended up um, doing some more targeted uh, strategies and programming for the young people in our RHY programs or, or homeless runaway youth. Um, but we found also that there were many programs that were um, funded through the city council, right, through our discretionary unit, that we had a whole list of food pantries. And those um, programs were, those lists were given out to our community-based organizations who serve in CSBG so that um, the word could get out about where uh, we could address um, food insecurities in those poor and local communities. So there's a lot of ways that we use the data, not just in terms of setting priorities, but also to look at many of the programs that DYCD funds and how could they be leveraged, what collaborations could be had, what partnerships can be developed um, so that we could address that particular need. Uh, and how has the um, CNA improved this surveying methodologies over the year? And what's being done, you know, currently and um, how would you improve the methodology? I think the methodology has been improved um, over the last four years at least. Um, uh, the f first survey of 2013 was a very uh, simple survey and um, it got the job done. We then, uh, in 2016, we uh, developed that survey so that there were many more questions where we can get drilled down on what really were the community needs. Um, the, we then did a, an ambassador's project where, uh, because you, I think you asked this question, that um, if the community needs assessment is being done every three years, then what happens in between? And so we decided that we would do these uh, year or mid-year, mid-CNA uh, strategies where we could go and have conversations with the community about whether those needs that, that they named a year, a year and a half ago, were they the same needs or had anything changed? What we found was that in some cases, um, um, because there were conversations, many other things came up. For example, things like um, services for young people who have special needs, um, veteran services, things like that. We do, um, and so in our next community needs assessment, it's, um, it's sort of a hybrid between that first one I described and the second one I described, and so it's simpler, but it does get uh, to each community based on what they've said before. So I think uh, the methodology continues to improve. We have a uh, unit at DYCD that is dedicated to improving that methodology, and um, we're very proud of the work that they've done because I think that the community really will appreciate the way that we're, we're going to do it this year, and we're happy to send you some information on that. Later. Of the of the employers who you surveyed, <clears throat> what industries did they um, represent in the community needs assessment? Uh, I can re respond generally. We targeted employers who work with the Ladders for Leaders program, so they're mm -hmm. pretty familiar with mm -hmm. DYCD, mm -hmm. and so. Um, you know, as a council member, I understand that's a pretty wide-ranging uh, array of, of occupations across the board. So of the employers, um, uh, in the CNA, um, employers indicated that they wanted employees with industry-specific knowledge, leadership skills, critical thinking, and problem-solving skills. How has DYCD addressed these concerns in terms of programming and services that they provide? I would um, reference the Deputy Commissioner's earlier testimony about some of the stated priorities of the Commissioner. We're looking to um, promote an overall pathway, and um, 
Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't want to over, <laughs> over, <laughs> over answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think that's another illustration uh, related to some of the deputy commissioners that what we've learned from the t 2016 uh, needs assessment to promote different directions. So do you think that you successfully implemented implemented all of the um, the recommendations, the community needs assessment recommendations? We have we have addressed many of the local uh, needs um, through the prioritizations of those needs by those communities. But then there were overall um, recommendations or uh, insights that came out of the CNA that had to do uh, some uh, with. Um, uh, marketing, for example, getting the word out, right? Mm -hmm. So what we've done, actually we've done a lot of thinking about how to market programs, what does that look like, giving coaching and guidance to the community-based organizations around how could you get the word out. Um, we used uh, the DYCD engines or social media to, to get the word out. Um, we're doing a lot of thinking with young people about how to, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we renamed a lot of uh, the workforce programs, the young people actually renamed those programs themselves to work, learn, and grow. All those kinds of programs were named sort of uh, by uh, acronyms, but they we changed the marketing and looking at each one of our uh, departments and units and seeing how is it that we can get the word out more um, efficiently and how many people uh, can we tell about these programs so that um, people really do know what the program means and does in that particular community. So, um, Commissioner, one of the things was the CNA report recommended improvements to DYCD's data collection practices and, um, and the use of better surveys to empower the NDAs. Um, was that one of the recommendations that you looked at and did you, um, and did you try to implement uh, some change to that? Yes, that, that process is underway when you talk about um, data collection. The, um, the agency was able to receive a significant award to improve its IT systems. And so portfolio by portfolio, we are uh, looking to migrate our programs at better data collection, uh, easier and more straightforward for the providers to interface with. Mm -hmm. We haven't moved the CSBG portfolio yet, but we are planning to. So there's a lot of meetings that uh, my team and other teams are having about setting up the appropriate business rules to, to make that migration. Okay. But ultimately, where it will get the, the agency, along with greater efficiency, is the, the intention for the new uh, system will better allow the providers to make referrals from one to another within the system. So this is another way the agency is looking to leverage the impact of one contract to another and make it easier for participants to find their way through navigating all the services they may need. So that's the desired end state over the next couple of years working with IT. And to help the NDAs um the, the it will positively yeah. impact the NDA programs, mm -hmm. but cutting across the board, it will be to the betterment of all the programs that DYCD is, is funding. Um, last year, um, the Youth Services Committee had a hearing on youth civic engagement, and um, DYCD provided more opportunities for youth to volunteer and become more involved in civic issues and community projects. Um, uh, has that happened, actually? Because um, that was one of the recommendations on the CNA, was to more youth um, opportunities for volunteer and civic engagement. So um, one of the ways that we did that, we mentioned that in the testimony, that we, want, we really do want 16-year-olds um, and above on our boards so they could be part of this process. Uh, obviously, that... Um, would allow them to develop leadership skills. But early in the process, could you imagine a young person 
um, setting priorities, um, funding priorities for their community. So I think um, we're doing that through involving young people in boards that are sitting at the table and making, uh, influencing those boards in terms of funding priorities. But apart from that, the YCD has um, developed a civic engagement statement um, that we um, have uh, have begun to look at how best to engage young people, not just young people, but also all our NABs and civic engagement um, endeavors. Um, uh, you, if you can describe the, the thing that's gonna happen soon with the um, step, step thing. The summit? Yeah. On May 11th, the agency is holding a youth summit and so in our internal discussions, we've looked historically at attendance and to a large degree, younger youth participate in those events. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Neighborhood Advisory Board Liaison Team is doing a special track for older youth on civic engagement broadly. And there will also be the opportunity for young people who are on boards to join with other young people that the agency recruits through other programs and other means. And by the end of the day, they will also be advised the opportunity to join a board if that's appropriate for them. But we want to provide value to current members and to the community alike. So it's another integration strategy. We're trying to make sure we're bolstering a segment uh, that hasn't necessarily taken full, full opportunity at the summit, and we're actually looking forward to it. Um, do all of the um, NABs have uh, a youth member on them currently? Not at this point, but we're working on that. That is um, something that we have as a goal this year. Um, we want to make sure actually this summit would, would be a recruitment vehicle mm -hmm. for that to happen. But I, as I said in my uh, testimony, we're looking to um, the community-based organizations to send us young people to be on these boards and to engage in uh, civic engagement projects. Um, what would you say um, uh, was maybe the percentage of boards that do have a, a young person on it at this time? About 30%. About 30%. And um, you're going to use the Youth Summit, and um, and you reach out to community-based organizations. Um, are you also our cornerstones and our beacons? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and our schools. Yes. Yeah. Um, because uh, some of the youth leaders, we have other uh, uh, leadership programs that are that come through our uh, cornerstones and our beacons and our schools. So that's where we would recruit um, young people. Okay. Um, I guess we've asked you about all the questions that. <laughs> we um, we we wanted to or need to. I want to thank you, um, Commissioner Gutierrez, and um, and Deputy Commissioner. Uh, I'd like the Assistant Commissioner. Okay, Assistant Commissioner. Assistant Commissioner. I would like to testifying uh, today. Um, Chair Rose, um, make uh, another appeal for your help with um, filling the seats. Um, uh, oh, absolutely. And so any way that you could help, that would be amazing because we really, really want to get these boards fully filled so that we can uh, begin our And our if you could provide assessment. us with um, a list of the um, elected officials that need to make appointments, um, that would be helpful. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and and we we had been joined by Council Member Eugene. I'm so sorry. Um, the next. Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, uh, that's down. It's only. Uh, oh, okay. Um, and our next panel, and only panel, <coughs> is um, Jack Chernak. And uh, when you get to the microphone, would you identify yourself and your organization?
Okay. Um, identify. Um, turn the mic on. Give us a, give us yes. your name. Good morning. And your organization. Good morning. My name is Jack Chernak. I am part of the Neighborhood Advisory Board. I am the Assistant Secretary at Neighborhood Advisory Board 1 in Staten Island. Can I read? And you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jack Chernak. I am the Assistant Secretary for Staten Island Neighborhood Advisory Board 1. Today I will testify on the youth services that are needed in Staten Island District 49. Our Councilwoman Debbie Rose is a champion for her constituents. Our Councilwoman has advocated and fought for needed resources that have created a safer environment on Staten Island. She has personally fought for funding for violence prevention programs as well as after school programs that have resulted in proactive solutions for families and residents in her district. As great as she is, our at-risk neighborhoods are still in need of funding to keep crime down and to help support the youth in a positive way. We need extra funding to help provide more summer youth jobs. Summer youth jobs are one way to keep the youth engaged in a positive way to make money. Being a product of summer youth employment, I remember how it saved me from the social ills of the 80s crack era. I lost quite a few friends to the streets because they didn't have a job. The same situation still presents themselves today. After school and summer school programs are needed for elementary age students. Most are too young to qualify for summer youth, but they still need to have an outlet and a safe space to have fun. Parents also need to know while they are at work that their children are in safe environments. Youth programs are critical in at-risk neighborhoods. It is a way to build neighborhood morale and to keep young people on the right path. If we don't have funding focused on youth, we will bring the incarceration rates back up. High school dropout rates will increase and possibly teen pregnancy. These are all things that can be curbed with proper funding. Please continue to allocate funds to help support our youth. I believe the children are our future. Let us do all we can to help ensure their lives will be productive and positive. Thank you for allowing me to speak and to be part of this process. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for testifying. And um, I, I just have a few questions for you, OK? Sure. Um, you serve on the Neighborhood Advisory Board, right? Yes. Action Board. Very um, proud to do so as well. OK. All right. Um, do you believe that they are effective? Um, and what challenges have you um, witnessed? Yes, I do believe they are very effective. I like uh, the way that we do the surveys. Uh, I believe that it's very important that we go into the community to get a pulse mm -hmm. of what the community is saying more than just having people from higher ups and maybe that are not from the community uh, just saying where the money should be spent. So I do believe in the process. And some of the challenges I think we face, um, I would like to have more youth involvement. We are um, looking to have more youth come on. Uh, we have youth groups. Um, we are focusing uh, on more of the youth to come in to give their, uh, the way they feel and to maybe even possibly join so that this way they can become part of the Neighborhood Advisory Board and learn about uh, the way that the process works and this way we can hopefully um, get the information out so that more people will be um, excited to do the surveys and understand the process. You participated in the community needs assessment? Yes. Okay. Um, did you think that the it, it was effective and do you think that it actually captured the true needs and concerns of the community? Uh, yes and no. I would like to say that it, it did. Uh, we were able to go into the community. We were able to ask questions. We were able to, um, again, get a pulse of what came back. Sometimes I also feel that it all depends on who we ask the surveys 
and the demographics of the people who fill out the surveys because that's the biggest part of the funding. So if we as neighborhood advisory uh, chair people or uh, people who are involved in the in, in actual group, mm -hmm. we just need to get into more different diverse communities in order to get a real pulse on what's going on. When it comes to just my community on the North Shore of Staten Island, let's say if I just went to one neighborhood mm -hmm. and asked these questions. Mm -hmm that wouldn't really be a real representation of the entire district. So um, you think that the um, community needs assessment should um, be broader, uh, it, it should expand sort of the boundaries um, of the catchment area that, that it represents? No, no I, I do believe that it, it does that. I just think that we might need more of a diverse staff, more of a diverse group of members so that this way when we go out into the community it's being filtered throughout the entire community so do you um think that there should be more members of the of, of the nab or um when you say diverse are you talking about um what i'm really uh, just talking about economic, age ethnically age, oh, age economics as well mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. as you can see i'm not a very young man anymore <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> and um, I just would love to see younger people involved because I think again like I stated here that they are the future so if we can have them involved and get their serve and get them to uh, participate maybe more in surveys then I think that we can have a better representation of what's needed you think there should be more than one um, youth member on the on the NAB yes yes um, and do you have any other recommendations on like what the the comp the comp composition of the NAB should should be? Or? Well, I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, Jorge does a real good job, as well as um, I forget your name. Nita does a real good job in getting the word out. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it has to do with just participation from the community. Um, I haven't figured that out on how we could possibly uh, get to them, mm -hmm. but um, it is a need that I think that I would like to um, try to figure out. And do you think that the, uh, the needs that were expressed in the community needs assessment have been addressed? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, I believe that the last time we did the uh, survey, um, I don't think we had anything to do with substance abuse um, as part of the survey. Um, again, our community coming from Staten Island, we are leading the nation in opiate overdoses. So, um, and again, for such a small population, us having one of the smallest boroughs here in New York City to lead the nation, I think that speaks in volume or maybe on just some of those needs assessments, how they could possibly be changed. And do you think the period of time between the three years duration between the community needs assessment and um, and any other surveys that happen is sufficient, is adequate? Um, at times, no, because I think mm -hmm. things change. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want it to be uh, a year, no, but sometimes three years can be a long time when it comes to the needs of the community, especially, again, coming from Staten Island, um, there's a lot of changes that are happening. Uh, our North Shore is going to start looking really, really different when it comes to Stapleton, St. George, as well as New Brighton. Yeah. Um, these are areas that um, are going to have some real economic development. Uh, businesses are moving in. Um, I was even hearing certain gossip about uh, certain uh, housing complexes no longer being under NYCHA you know, uh, and it becoming more of a public housing type of thing. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. And again, three years could be a long time when it comes to the needs of that community and on how quick it could change. I'm sure that, you know, three years might be too long. I want to thank you so much for coming and testifying today. Thank you for having uh, me. Thanks a lot, Mr. Chernak.
Jack. <laughs> um, well, uh, seeing that there are no other um, individuals to testify, I want to thank DYCD for coming and for testifying. I want to thank you, Mr. Chernak, for, um, for testifying today. And this hearing is now adjourned at 11.52. 11.52. 11 Thank you for coming. <laughs>